Hi, everyone. Welcome to our lecture on language acquisition. In this lecture, I'll talk only about first language acquisition, because we need to understand how one language is acquired. And then in the next lecture, we'll talk about bilingual and multilingual acquisition and how ling where heritage languages fit in. Okay. So first, we'll talk about some wonderings about language acquisition. Like, what are some questions that we might wonder about and inquire about and be curious about when it comes to uh, first language acquisition? Uh, what's the difference between language acquisition versus language learning? Is there a difference? And we'll talk about some theories of language acquisition. And there's a lot more about this in the reading that you'll have to do for this module. So here are some wonderings about language acquisition. And you might have other wonderings and curio curiosities as well. So one is, how does a baby learn and figure out what the languages are in their environment? How do they know uh, where word ends and where another one begins? How do they acquire the meanings of words and all of those different subcomponents of language that we talked about before? Um, also, how do they acquire language without explicit instruction? So typically babies, you know, young children just learn the language without us sitting them down and explaining to them and giving them like lessons on how to, um, how to use the language. Um, and how is it that like by, by the age of, you know, three, their grammar is pretty much in place by the age of five, certainly by the time typical kindergarten begins, uh, a five-year-old will know a lot more about their language than let's say a second language learner that learned that same language with a lot of explicit instruction and hours and hours of studying. And they may still not uh, you know, by and large, for the vast majority of people, they may still not know the same amount as a five-year-old um, native speaker of the language. And you know, why do adults have such a ha much harder time learning than uh, young children? How uh, How is it language can be acquired even when individuals have different kinds of cognitive differences? So they may not be able to learn some, you know, other things, um, but they are able to learn language. So uh, for example, you know, if you think of individuals with Down syndrome, they acquire language, Williams syndrome, they acquire language, um, and they have other areas in their lives where they cannot uh, do the same things as individuals who don't have those conditions um, can do. And another question would be, do we learn our second languages and third languages and so on differently than we learn our first language? There are lots and lots of questions. I mean, if you just think, if you just listen to me speaking, and the example, dacă eu aș începe să vorbesc în românește, cum vorbesc acum, uh, imaginați-vă că, că sunteți un bebeluș care ascultă ce vorbesc eu. Cum și-ar da seama um, despre ce, la, la ce să dea atenție, uh, cum să înceapă să vorbească, ok? So you probably were like, what the heck is this just do, <laughs> right? So I started speaking Romanian a little bit, and I was just saying, if I just started speaking this, you know, imagine yourself in the position of, you know, a young child having all of this come at them. Uh, and how do they figure it out? So all of those are really good questions, and there are lots and lots of other questions. And uh, linguists and philosophers and psychologists uh, have been trying to figure out um, how language acquisition happens, and we have some answers, and there's still a lot that we're still working on. So um, let's see. First, is there a difference between acquisition versus learning? So the main difference is that acquisition is something that happens naturalistically. So that's when we say acquisition is how you're just acquiring it in a more naturalistic environment. Uh, so learning a first or a native language, and if you learn two languages from birth, same thing, that would be language acquisition. And learning is what happens af if you learn a language after uh, the first few years of life. So you, usually this is applied to when you're learning in a structured setting, like in a classroom, right? And this is also referred to as second language acquisition. Okay. So uh, this is important when we talk about uh, heritage languages, whether they heritage language speakers have learned their language in the home, right? And if they're learners, they're learning the language like in a classroom setting, let's say. Okay, so here are some theories um, that have been proposed uh, at different times that, ex that aim to explain how a language is acquired. I'm going to talk about each of these, and there's a lot more in your reading that I'm asking you to complete for this class. So 
One theory is the innateness hypothesis. And this theory um, says that the language faculty, so the capacity for language is innate, and that humans have an innate predisposition for acquiring language. Um, not that we are born knowing the language that or um, that we're going to speak, or that we are born with. If I'm born to English speakers, I'm going to speak English. That's not what that means. What it means that is that our biological makeup is, um, is is structured in such a way that it will acquire language. So support for this hypothesis comes from Lenneberg's biologically controlled behavior traits. So. This is like, we don't make a conscious decision to learn language. We just end up learning it under typical typical development, right? So we're talking here about typical development, not when something interferes with typical development. Um, there are certain milestones that uh, kids reach at um, when it comes to language acquisition, just like in other biologically controlled behaviors, like in walking, for example. Um, so these types of traits make it, um, you know, provide support for this idea that there is an innate capacity for learning language. Uh, another uh, piece of support for this hypothesis comes from what's called the poverty of the stimulus. And the stimulus, when it comes to language, is the language itself, the linguistic input that kids receive. The term poverty of the stimulus uh, refers to the idea that when we, you know, when kids receive input, when they hear language or they see sign language, um, that input is not perfect. So if you were to read the transcript of my presentation here, you will find areas where there are a lot of um, false starts or backtracking and restarting a thought. And despite those kinds of imperfections, so to speak, when we we speak to kids or when they hear the linguistic input around them, they still learn language. And another piece of evidence comes from this idea of the critical period. And the critical period is a period of time during which some behavior must be acquired in order for it to be uh, fully developed, okay? So, in when it comes to language acquisition, that critical period is referred to as the period of time during which language acquisition has to be taking place in order for that um, language to be acquired with native-like competence. This primarily is with reference to a first language acquisition. So if, um, if someone does not get exposure to a language under, typically under situations or conditions of neglect, or abandonment or some other just rare uh, situations where a child just does not really receive linguistic input, um, that first language for that to be to, to be taking place, uh, there is a critical period. Um, when it comes to language acquisition, that's posited to be between birth to the onset of puberty. So around you know age eight or so, um, when it comes for a second link to a second language, that critical period uh, kind of extends slightly because the assumption is that for a second language there was or was already a first language acquired, so um, it, it's it, it's a little bit later, but by you know by kind of by towards the end of puberty, um, and typically it's referenced as around age twelve or so. Uh, and this period is not set in stone. It's more of a gradient uh, period of time. So some support for the existence of a critical period comes from, uh, as I mentioned earlier, from neglected children. So there have been situations, maybe you've heard of Jeannie, the wild child. There's a, it's called, um, there's a, a YouTube documentary you can find on YouTube. It's called Jeannie's Secret of the Wild Child. And it's about Jeannie, who was this girl who was discovered, I think, in 1974. She was about 13 years old, and she had been uh, kept in a, basically tied to a potty chair and not spoken to, uh, beaten for making noise, and she was she did not speak. So uh, there was a big, big team of researchers and doctors and scientists working with her, trying to figure out what uh, what was happening there and trying to teach her language. And she was able to learn some language, sort of to learn words, but she was never able to fully acquire grammar. Um, 
So if you're interested in that further, you can look that up. Um, also have evidence from sign languages. Um, so this particularly comes from Nicaraguan sign language and other sign languages and um, how different aspects of language structure are affected. So sometimes it may be only the syntax that's affected or technology that's affected, as I mentioned for, um, for Jeannie, she wasn't able to acquire essentially the syntax, um, like how to put all the words together in a sentence in, in English in this case. So uh, all of these to support this idea of the innateness uh, hypothesis. Right? Another theory uh, which really has been refuted um, and it was an earlier theory that's claimed that children learn language by memorizing and imitating what they hear. And to some extent, yes, kids do have to imitate what they hear because otherwise they would have to just invent the language on their own, right? Um, so they do learn the language of their environment, but the that only explains a very small part of language acquisition because after you're done with that, the sentences that we're producing on a daily basis in our conversations and the sentences that we're hearing or taking in or seeing visually, if it's a sign language, in our conversations are generally newly created. So we are creating language. We're not just repeating memorized sentences that we've heard or said before, right? So when kids uh, make, when they start to speak, if you've been around kids, you know that they make errors, right? So they um, errors from the perspective of the, the adult speech. And where did those come from? If they're just imitating, they couldn't have just repeated that, right? They're saying things that are not from what they got in the input. Um, and uh, so that supports the idea that this theory cannot be uh, explaining how kids learn uh, language. Reinforcement theory is another theory. Um, and also, it's been uh, refuted. And this theory claims that children learn by having reinforced uh, positive behaviors, positive linguistic behaviors, and, uh, and that's how they are able to learn. There isn't really much support for this theory. Uh, it's, it's really more popular belief that adults correct children's grammar. They really don't correct grammar. Even when they do correct kids' speech, mostly they correct lies. Like if a child said a lie, um, then adults will call them on that. But they don't correct children's grammar in when it comes to like making a grammatical error that's not the when the production is not the same as the adults. So let's look at some examples of what this looks like. Okay, so uh, this is an example from a child who is two years old at the time. And here's some, like the situation was the child and the mother are reading a book, a picture book, and mother points to a picture of a pig and says, what is this? And the child says, this is an oink. And then pointing to a rooster, and what is this? This is a cock a doodle doo and what's this pointing to the scissors? This is a cut. Well, clearly those are not what the names of those animals and objects are, right? Um, but the child makes sense in what they're saying here. There is a relationship there, but this also came from the child's own mind. So they didn't just imitate what they heard in the, in the previous conversations, presumably when they've read this book before, or else they would have said pig, right? Okay. So this demonstrates that it's not demonstrates that it's not imitation. What about reinforcement? So maybe if uh, they are corrected, they can get it right, right? So this is actually the same child at age two and a half. The child hands the mom a basket and says, "This is yours." And then she has a basket too and says, "And this is mine's." The mother says, "Yes, that is yours, and this is mine." So the mother noticed that did not actually. Um, draw attention to that is not the way you say it you have to say mine she just said it in the way that the adult form is the child noticed and says yes this is mine this is me so if you, if you just pause the video you can think a little bit about why did the child do that and notice that later on she goes back to this is mine so if you pause the video you can think about why that might be and then you can come back to this explanation so in English, the possessive pronouns are mine, yours, his, hers, it's, ours, 
yours, theirs. So notice all of them except for mine have a, that S at the end. So the child in this case wanted S's on everything because that's what her grammar, as she's developing her mental grammar, that's what she came up with. Um, and so reinforcement didn't really necessarily, didn't work. It, the child needs to figure that out for themselves. Which takes us to this theory of active construction of grammar. So just as I said for the um, minds on the previous slide, children have to figure out the rules of their grammar, their mental grammar, and build their lexicon. Um, and they build that from the input and they draw patterns and they form hypotheses about how things might work in the language. And then they revise those hypotheses as they get more and more data. For example, one rule they may figure out is that, ah, you know, if I want to make a past tense verb, I have to add basically ed. And for plural, I have to add s, right? So you, we can see this um, in the systematic errors that they make. So for plural, they might say children's and sheep's, right? Um, and fishes and um, you know, any of the irregular nouns that don't form the plural with S, children will say them with, with the S, which shows that they've learned this rule for the plural and they're just applying it everywhere. And for verbs for the past tense, you hear kids saying hold it and drink it and put it and I seed it. Like um, instead of I saw it to see, I seed it. I taked it, gived, righted, telled, hit it, leaped. And then also I have these other examples here, a cutter and an izer. A cutter was someone who cuts well, um, and an izer is someone who sees well. So kids use language in systematic ways as they're developing their grammar, meaning that they form their own little system that may be different from the adult system, yet it's still a system that they're using. So back to the previous examples, when the child was using oink for pig and cockadoodle do for rooster, um, the same child had ba for sheep and moo for cow. So instead of having the name of the animal, they just had all the sounds that the animals make. So it's a little system. So again, they couldn't be imitating these words from adults because adults don't say uh, holded and drinked and taked. Um, the children constructed these rules on their own. And as they get more information, more data, they are exposed to more language. They figure out that there are some words that are exceptions to these rules. Okay, so here's some more examples that show this um, act of construction of grammar rules being implemented. So this is a child at three or six months. Why he didn't be here when I beed little. Mouse is like cheese and I liked it you, right? So you can see the application of these rules. Other theories that are compatible actually with, with the act of construction of grammar are connectionist theory and social interaction theory. So connectionist theory basically holds that uh, children form neural connections that get reinforced by input frequency. So they we draw statistics, we hear you know, children um, have lots and lots of um, you know, information and input. And uh, this theory basically says that we don't have to have um, an innate ability for language. Our brains are very, very good at finding patterns and we have an innate ability for statistics, for drawing statistics. And based on the statistics of the data that we get, um, we form connections that reinforce a particular pattern. So that's how connections theory um, explains how language is acquired and explains um, some of these um, patterns that we see in child language. Social interaction theory, says that children learn through social interactions and child-directed speech is helpful and beneficial to language acquisition. Um, and I don't think that anybody would disagree that we do need social interaction in order to, be, uh, to learn language. We cannot learn language just on our own. And research also shows that child-directed speech, so child-directed speech is the kind of speech that you, know, you have a higher inflection, higher pitch, more variety in your um, in inflection and, and tonality. So, um, so you can say, hi there, how are you doing? And children prefer that kind of language, that kind of speech. 
However, it's not necessary. There are some cultures in which adults do not speak to children like that, where child directed speech is not used, and yet children do learn language. So it's not necessary, but it's helpful. So both of these theories are compatible with the active construction of grammar and the innateness hypothesis. Um, the active construction of grammar one is the one that linguists generally, I just don't speak for all linguists, but um, a, a large number of linguists are the are um, more adoptive of this particular theory. Okay, so let's just wrap it up. What do we know so far? We know that the best time to learn a language is when you're young, like before puberty, really before age seven or eight is the best time. Um, and there are certain factors that facilitate language acquisition, such as human interaction, a rich linguistic environment, and child-directed speech, though, as I said, that's not necessary. And also, all children go through the same stages of language development. We didn't talk about stages in here. Um, it's in the reading, so I encourage you to please go and look at those um, stages of language development. So regardless of what language they learn, they go through the same stages. Um, the, in the perception and production of sounds, making syllables, the first words, one word, two words, three word stage, their grammatical development, and so on. And the important thing is also that the sequence of the stages is the same, but the ages are not the same. So there is variation in when kids start to talk, for example. All right, so in the next uh, video, we are going to talk about bilingual, multilingual acquisition.